The skulls of three women entered on the island of Gotland nearly a millennium ago exhibit deliberate modifications characterized by elongated cone-shaped forms, a tad alien if you look at them. A recent study suggests that these peculiarities in the skulls of the Viking Age women on the Baltic island could signify interactions with the Black Sea region. Let's see how. The alteration believed to have been initiated at birth through head wrapping aligns with a practice historically associated with the nomadic Huns from Asia, prevalent in southeastern Europe until the 10th century. This practice is, however, unique to Gotland among Scandinavian regions, suggesting external influence, as noted by Matthias Toplak, lead author of the study and an archaeologist at the Viking Museum Hedebu in Germany. While the exact visibility of these modifications remains uncertain, they could have denoted a particular social status or affiliation, perhaps to a distant culture where such practices were common. These modifications may have been limited to a select group of women across generations, highlighting their lineage or ties to trade networks. Toplak proposes that the skull alterations symbolized trading connections, representing influence and prosperity in commerce. Additionally, the filing of teeth, observed primarily in Viking Age Scandinavia, appears deliberate and possibly served as a marker of identity, a clandestine one, for certain merchant groups, potentially serving as an initiation ritual. Though originating in Sweden's Upland region, the concentration of filed teeth found in skulls of Gotland underscores the island's significance as a trading hub during the later Viking Age and the subsequent Middle Ages. However, this habit gradually disappeared from Scandinavia after the 12th century, coinciding with the emergence of merchant guilds. If you want to know more about tooth filing, I made a separate video about this a while ago. You can find it in a card above or at the end of the presentation. Skull modification does not seem to be a custom of Viking Age culture, not at all. Modifications can indeed serve as markers within an ongoing communication process that solidify the expression of social identity. In this context, the body transforms into a sort of medium, joining other mediums within documented communities in archaeology. Before we detail the skull modifications, let's review a little bit the example with filed teeth. So, the Scandinavian examples are characterized by single horizontally filed furrows on the incisors of the upper and partially also the lower jaw. Initially, the filings were regarded as accidental changes caused by a specific craft activity which leaves different marks as demonstrated in examples from Norse Greenland. More than 130 individuals with filed teeth are known from the Scandinavian Viking Age. Half of them have been found on the island of Gotland. 46 biologically male individuals with filed teeth were observed in the cemetery of Kopashvik, south of present-day Visby. The cemetery encompassed some 330 burials lying in what appeared to be two different regions, most of them dating from around 900 to 1050. The distribution of individuals with filed teeth in Kopashvik shows a distinct pattern as 90% of the graves were lying in the northern area of the cemetery, with 80% being male. Aside from this concentration, no further patterns in terms of grave structure were observed, arrangement of the deceased or accompanying objects. Another notable site on Gotland is the Slitha Cemetery in Orthem Parish, where 13 male individuals with filed teeth were discovered. Despite the smaller total number of approximately 40 Viking Age burials in Slita, the proportion of individuals with filed teeth is even higher than in Kopashvik. In Opland, 8 or 9 individuals from Sigtuna and 4 individuals from Birka exhibited tooth modifications as well. The most recent instance of tooth modification dating to the 11th or the 12th century was found in the Vanhem Monastery Cemetery in Västergötland in Sweden as well. They are found both in burials which, based on dating and expression, indicate a pre-Christian background, such as the early graves from Birka and the Bolstanes, and in later burials which must be seen in a Christian context, such as Sigtuna. The clear concentration on Gotland must be taken into consideration when interpreting this custom. However, variations and differences in form and intensity can be identified from geographical areas such as Gotland, Upland or Denmark. 
Most filings on the individuals from Gotland and Skåne, including one single case from England, show striking resemblances, suggesting that they were executed most likely by one and the same person, or at least from a very small group of people. The Gotlandic tooth filings and the cases of artificially modified skulls, which appeared together in at least two cemeteries, Ire and Havor make Gotland as a geographically clearly defined study area an interesting case study for understanding the meaning of body modification in the Viking Age. A later, more spectacular interpretation regarding the filings, as markers of a warrior elite who wanted to show both their bravery and resistance to pain, while also appearing more fearsome to their enemies, was also taken from the tooth filing of one of the decapitated individuals found in the well-known mass grave at Ridgeway Hill in England, which at first was interpreted as a mass grave of Scandinavian warriors. However, few individuals show traces of weapon-inflicted traumata on the skeletal remains that would indicate participation, active participation in armed conflicts. Another interpretation was that tooth filings could be regarded as a marker of slaves. This was initially based on two males with filed teeth that were either executed or sacrificed, and on the connection between filings and prone burials at the cemetery of Kopashvik. Possible intentional tooth filings have been observed on further individuals in so-called deviant burials from Denmark, possibly linked to the sacrifice of slaves. However, in the case of the individuals from Gotland, this explanation is not really that convincing as most of the individuals were buried with grave goods such as belt sets, knives and jewellery. In the case of skull modifications, this custom is known particularly from Mesoamerica and South America, as well as from the migration period in Central Europe and the Caucasus. From the Middle Ages, a few modified skulls are known from Central and Southeastern Europe. They are from the late Viking Age, Volin in Poland, from Slovakia, and especially from Bulgaria, as they date to the period between the 9th and 11th century. So far, three cases of artificial skull modifications are known from the Scandinavian Viking Age. They are from the cemeteries in Kvie, Eksta Parish, Ire, Helvi Parish and Havur, Hablingbu Parish, all on Gotland Island. They are females, presumably buried in the second half of the 11th century. And there have been estimations of these modifications of the skull and they are considered to be very moderate, especially in the case from Kvie, classified as minor to medium. While the index of the skull from Kvie might lie within the normal variation, as similar indices of a few skulls from the migration period cemeteries as Valhagar on Gotland suggest, the cranial index of the skull from Ire and the dimensions and shape of the skull from Havur do indicate an intentional artificial modification of the head. Both the female individual from Ire, who died at an age approximately 25 to 30 years, and the female individual from Havur, who died at an age of 55 to 60 years, were buried according to local burial traditions with rich jewellery. The female from Havur was even buried with four animal head brooches, a type that is both unique to and characteristic to Gotland. Such an exaggerated number of brooches is only known from two other graves, according to Toplak. Interestingly, the typical Gotlandic box brooches were absent in all three graves. None of the three graves allows secure conclusions about the religious background of the burials. The absence of any real grave goods cautiously signals an early Christian context. As indicated by DNA analysis of the two individuals from Havur and Kvie, the female from Havur was of Gotlandic origin, while the female from Kvie came from the eastern Baltic area. The custom of skull modification probably originated in southeastern Europe. It was predominantly, but not exclusively, connected with biological females. Close trade contacts between Scandinavia or Gotland and Eastern Europe, down to the Black Sea, are well documented archaeologically, but it remains a little unclear how the custom of skull modification actually reached Gotland. 
Either the three females from Havor, Ire and Kvie were born in southeastern Europe, perhaps as children of Gotlandic or East Baltic traders, and the skulls were modified there in the first years of life, or the modifications were made on Gotland or in the Eastern Baltic, respectively, and thus represent a cultural adoption unknown to the Scandinavian Viking Age. So how can we explain this phenomenon? Or generally speaking, how can we explain such deviant practices in archaeology? Well, we can resort here to communication theory. Think of it like this. If we view the human body as a means of conveying messages through artificial alterations, it serves both as a repository and a means for cultural messages and information. These properties arise from technological interventions such as procedures, tools and energy input, as well as their societal utilization, shaping the context in which meanings are interpreted. Examining archaeological discoveries through the lens of communication and interaction, bodily modifications can be thus interpreted as signals, transmitting immaterial meanings comprehensible to members of a social cultural community through shared symbolic systems. Whether through tooth alterations or artificial cranial shaping, these modifications primarily symbolize culturally encoded concepts, thereby rendering the modified human body as a representation of social identity. Social categorization emerges as a fundamental human inclination, aiming to position individuals within their social milieu. Physical appearance often serves as a vehicle for expressing social identity, employing elements like clothing, jewelry, hairstyles, and body modifications as a distinct marker of belonging to a specific social group. Functioning as a medium, the body facilitates the representation and reconstruction of social, ethnic, religious affiliations, allowing individuals to convey desired identities. The process of this construction is dynamic and subject to external perceptions as well, influenced by the inclusion or exclusion of certain phenomena and groups. Identity operates on two levels, essentially. We have an internal one, shaped by intentional self-representation and interpersonal communication, and an external one, influenced by contextual perceptions from outside observers. Through these shared markers of social identity, perceptions of a social group can be intensified or manipulated by external forces, underscoring the intricate interplay between individual self-perceptions and external interpretation. In other words, we are at the border between how we express ourselves and how others perceive our expression, thus modifying our way of expressing ourselves. Archaeology is unfortunately limited to a few forms of markers of distinction. Most of these are temporary and no longer detectable in the archaeological records. Think of hairstyles, clothing, tattoos, all of which could have had a symbolic or iconic meaning at the time. Jewelry and dress elements, on the other hand, which are often perceived in the burial context as clearly distinguishing features of a specific, often ethnically or regionally interpreted identity, and which are usually preserved in the archaeological context, do not necessarily reflect the real affiliation. A special case occurs, however, when body modifications are used as a distinguishing feature that results in a permanent alteration of the bone structure, such as tooth filing or skull modification. Despite this permanence, body modifications can also be recontextualized and reinterpreted by societies within the framework of endogenous and exogenous interpersonal communication. An example is a form that is foreign to the local community, such as skull shaping, but since it cannot be changed, like dress elements, it forces people to react at it and to interact with it. Through the immutability of the body modification, it shows how the local community in the burial context interacted with this marker of distinction and of identity, known or foreign, communicated with it. Individuals were often defined by their membership in a particular social class or culturally distinct group, despite limited evidence indicating a higher social status for those with skull shaping. 
Considering the narrow temporal context in which the three women likely lived or were buried on Gotland, along with the absence of infant burials featuring modified skulls and drawing parallels from migration cemeteries in southern Germany, it seems plausible that skull modification was an imported tradition. The practice of modifying infant skulls, which involves permanently reshaping the skull bones during the first three years of life, likely required communal knowledge and could have been easily passed on by isolated individuals. If the skull modifications were performed on these three females in southeastern Europe, they might have returned to Gotland without transmitting this practice. In a small community like theirs, the transmission could have been lost or the decision not to adopt the practice might have also been deliberate. Perhaps it wasn't esteemed by the local society or the women themselves may have opted not to perpetuate it. The embodiment of this foreign identity would have likely been devalued in the local community as the significance of the skull modification signaling affiliation to a particular social group may not have been understood or deemed irrelevant by others. Such a portrayal of otherness might have been perceived unfavorably by the local society. The presence of these three females embodying such a distinct form of social and possibly ethnic affiliation must have indirectly contributed to the cultural and social understanding of identity in Gotlandic society. This manifestation of the other, however, in a society as deeply engaged in trading activities as that of Gotland in the Viking Age, likely indicated extensive contacts and commercial success. A social level shift in interpretation or a recontextualization of this embodiment can be speculated. This perception of embodiment as affiliation seen from the female's perspective as opting into a certain identity might have transformed into otherness seen from the perspective of Gotlandic society, so opting out of this society. The burials of the three females within the local Gotlandic society, particularly evident in the elaborate attire of the female from Havur, demonstrate a blend of social identity through adherence to local dress and burial customs alongside the utilization of this foreignness as a symbol of status associated with extensive and prestigious contacts. The skull modification indicates a form of non-verbal communication that was undoubtedly subject to evolution over time and even extended beyond death. This body modification might have been viewed as exotic or foreign characteristic, yet it didn't hinder the individual's integration into community and adherence to the established burial customs. Additionally, the skull modification may have served as a continual reminder of one's origins within the context of interpersonal communication. The modification was done in childhood, so for a certain group the meaning of it would have been significant and the larger community would have possessed at least similar conventions in order to interpret it. But it would have been difficult to understand the original meaning. So we have three females with an intriguing social identity resulting probably from contacts with other groups using this particular sign, the skull modification, in order to express the group they belonged to. But a sign which would have been interpreted and reinterpreted in Gotlandic society so that the three could also be integrated. Complicated as it may sound, it's extremely interesting from the point of view of how identity is perceived and constructed. However, tooth filings are a little easier from this perspective to interpret because they are proposed to serve as a cultural anchor within the Viking Age and possibly beyond Gotland, representing more than mere dental modifications. And they are viewed as deliberate displays of social identity, facilitating the integration of individuals into their particular communities. This intentional alteration is argued to signify affiliation with a specific group and foster mutual recognition among its members, thus contributing to the very intricate social-cultural dynamics of Viking societies. So there is really no easy way to explain skull shaping, but I do believe that this theory with the human body being a means of communication could prove very useful when trying to make sense of archaeological finds that don't really seem to fit the expected context. 
Do you know any similar examples and their potential meanings? Write in the comment section and for more on the Viking Age, the latest research and new interpretations, hit the subscribe button. This was Irina, thank you very much for listening and till next time.